friends, Mitchell and Pat. What are you doing, guys? We're alive. We're uh, it's at about the same place as we were last episode. The energy levels to start off the podcast are noticeably lower than last week. Yeah. Yep. It was a tough yep. weekend. Uh, yeah. We're. It was not not a good weekend for any of us, any of our clubs in particular. I got to stop making predictions on this podcast, man. Every time I say something's going to happen, every time I'm sure about something on the podcast, it just goes fucking so, so wrong. Most of the time it is wrong uh, for me too. Uh, betting last week, I didn't even calculate what we will we would be down if you did the $100 bet on everything. <laughs> Went three for 11. And we... Exponentially. So my my, my uh, strategy of going straight money line picks did not pan <laughs> out well. No. <laughs> Listen, we've said it a time and time again on this podcast. This is not a logistics thing, all right? Yeah, and I'm also done giving out bets for every single game we preview. I, I'm uh, limiting the number of bets I, I give out every single week because we are just going to get demolished. I'll probably get yeah, demoted from my own segment. <laughs> <laughs> it's it'll be Pat's picks moving forward. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I guess a couple of, you know, the way we've been starting the episode recently is a little bit of housekeeping, you know, like super, super current events, things like that. Uh, and then like checking in with our favorite teams, if anything we want to talk about has popped up here. So I guess Josh, uh, so we got MLS decision day coming up. How are you feeling about United's chances again then to the playoffs this year? It's exciting. It looked pretty slim a couple, uh, probably like last week on the weekend. I think we had like a 43% chance of making the playoffs. Uh, we got a big win last weekend while I was flying back to Maine or flying back to Minnesota. Sorry. And now I think our chances are like 70%. And we, we really have to beat the LA Galaxy on Sunday, basically, or at least get a draw. I think some other results would have to go our way as well. Um if we win, I believe we we advance. Um, the I'm game in for LA. You, man. I mean, dude, I hope so. It, it's been a good season. It would suck to just see it end and not making the playoffs. If that is the case, Adrian Heath needs to go because he's just proved. You know, he's been here for five years, and obviously, I'm you know a recent fan, so I'm not acclimated to all the frustrations those people have had. But I guess he's just been you know a pretty terrible manager all around. It's time to probably move on from him. Uh, but I hope to make the playoffs. I think it'll be exciting, and you never know. Maybe we'll go on a run and meet each other. Um, yeah, so, so speaking of, uh, the main stand will be at Foxborough on Sunday. Mitchell and I grabbed two tickets to the Rebs' first-round playoff game against Miami. Correction, Patrick. Uh, this is the last regular season game. Oh, it's a, you told me it was playoffs, dog. So, listen, they they had the extra week of international break. The playoffs don't start until the week of the 20th. Motherfucker. Yeah, well, motherfucker. Because I clicked on the link. I, I have a feeling. I have a feeling that with the logo change that the Revs have produced, that the website was hastily done. So because I clicked on the playoffs too. Yes. Because the, the first round of the playoffs is actually a dollar cheaper than our tickets were to sit in the fort. <laughs> That's a fucking steal if I've ever seen one. Hey, so no, the I guess the extra international break and with protocols and everything, there was an extended week. And also I clicked on the playoff tickets on sale now and it brought me to that game. And there was one game listed. So I figured, okay, this is the first round of the playoffs. I'm dumb, but we're going to see the last game of the winningest MLS team in history. That'll be sick. I still think it'll be a good time. And then you'll catch the main stand live at every Revolution home playoff game. And then in the final two, because you know what? I don't care if it's the main stand curse for me. The Revs are fucking winning it this year. They're doing the fucking thing. They need to. It's the last year with the uh, the crayon flag. They, I think they owe that logo, that era of revolution football at least a trophy be sick well technically we got the supporter shield at least but um let's let's go let's talk about europe because something really interesting happened uh antonio conte is now the manager 
of Tottenham Hotspur. Nuno sacked after 10 games in charge. Uh, boys, how do we feel about that? What do we what do we think? I think it's a bit harsh to to be honest. I think the situation at Tottenham isn't isn't the best. Uh, you know, I saw a tweet the other day that was they gave Jose or Pochettino, Jose, and Nuno all contracts until 2023, which just kind of shows their fucking incompetence as a club. They're a mess. Yeah, yeah. You can't be doing that. And I don't know if you can blame Nuno. I don't think his tactics were great by any means, and I. It's not his fault. I think it was a bad appointment, probably. By, by yeah, Spurs. that's. That, I think I got to agree with that. I don't think that Nuno was the right guy for the job from the get go. But it's not his fault either. And now I kind of feel bad that he, you know, he did leave Wolves, a place where he was kind of not doing as well last year, but definitely, you know, was a very successful manager and someone that was adored by the club. And now he's kind of oh, yeah. out of a job in, in the middle of the season. Uh, I kind of feel for him a little bit. Yeah, it's an interesting position that they put him in for sure. Um, I am excited to see how Conte does. Uh, uh, what do you guys think about those reports of that $100 million war chest, huh? Who do you think they're picking up in January, if anybody? Who I don't know. There? I have <laughs> yeah. zero players in mind for that. If, uh, if they're going to give Conte $100 million to spend in a winter transfer window, they'd better be signing somebody huge um, because just – the inconsistency to start the year, everything with Kane. I mean, I th- I think change is needed, but I don't know if Nuno getting sacked after 10 games is the right move. I, no, I don't. There's yeah. going to be some interesting moves. Uh, you know, like I just said, I don't really know who's dying to go to Tottenham. But at the same time, Conte has a lot of good relations with players in Italy. You could see a guy mm-hmm. like Lataro Martinez who looked like he was going to be on the way out this summer and was hinting around a move to Spurs. Maybe Conte goes to a 4-4-2 and plays him and Kane up top. There's rumors that Kane's completely bought in uh, to the team now that Conte is here and he's kind of done with the, the transfer requests for the time being, at least. For now, at least uh, for the yeah. rest of the year. And maybe a, a player like Nicolo Barella. Uh, too. That one's a little bit um, probably a, a further shot, but we know Inter's financial situation and, you know, Conte has relationships with those players and if he can convince them that there's a um, a project to join in North London, there could be some not? surprising moves. Yeah, for real. No, I think it's definitely going to be a real interesting next couple of months uh, as a Tottenham supporter for all of you out there. Um, do we think that this kind of basically says, like, Ole is the coach of United for the rest of the year, too. Like, the only real available man to replace him, like, realistically, is now off the market. So uh, it feels like a, a situation of Ole in, at least for the rest of the season, for United, too, at least in my opinion. Yeah, we mentioned it last week. Zidane is the only other person, and still, that's like, um, I mean, the chances of that happening just seem real slim. I don't think there's a better option out there on the market. I mean, yeah, Allegri's gone. Uh, Conte is now gone. There, there's literally no one out there that is worthy yeah, so, of a Manchester yeah, yeah. United job. So feels like Ole is going to be their guy at least for the remainder of the year. Um, other managerial news: uh, buzz around Newcastle is kind of starting to pick up with some stuff. Uh, Eddie Howe is now the name with Emery saying he's staying at Villarreal. So. That's interesting, too. I actually liked Eddie Howe a lot. I thought his board mid side was really, really good, at least for those those couple of years that they were up in the prem. They were, they played attractive ball, and Eddie Howe is not a bad coach. So He seems just like a, a man's man, too. Uh, yeah. I saw him at Bournemouth when I was over in England, and he he walked uh, – I was waiting for all, like, the players to come in and stuff, and he walked in, and he, he was just chatting it up with, like, everyone, you know, the stewards to – you know, people who are working at the, the front gate and he just seems like a real nice, like personable guy, just like, you know, yep. at a, at a very, uh, you know, minimal point of view from me, he just seems like a really good guy. And, and like you said, he did a really good job with Bournemouth and, uh, but it's an interesting one still because you're putting him in a, you're putting him in a very precarious situation to give him a blank checkbook and make signings when he historically made bad signings at Bournemouth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, he signed yeah. <laughs> Jordan Ibe and Dominic Solanke for a combined $40 million. Uh, so he doesn't have the best record of signing players. 
and then you're also going to get clubs who um, you're not going to get players for cheap at Newcastle because they know you have an open checkbook, so you're going to pay more cool. anyway. He yep. is going to have a lot of pressure to make the right decisions in terms of buying new players, and mm-hmm. uh, I think he can do it on the pitch. I, I just don't know if he can do it in the back room. They need a, a sporting director that's real top class. Yeah, that's true. So I think it, I think there's going to – like obviously there's going to be some other factors that play into his success there. Uh, at Newcastle, but I do think he's a, a good appointment. I, I, I don't I don't hate that at all, especially for like a first coach after their takeover. I I'm I like it. I think it's a good I think it's a good appointment if it if it comes to fruition and he becomes their guy. Yeah, it sounds like it does. Fabrizio just tweeted about it uh, a little bit ago. I'm kind of surprised. You know, we're, we're we're talking about sporting directors here for a second. I'm surprised the name Michael Edwards hasn't been thrown around at Newcastle. The rumors are saying that he, uh, obviously the sporting director at Liverpool for the past, you know, handful of years has done a great job, you know, making some really good budget signings and making the best out of a small budget at Liverpool. There's rumors he's going to RB Leipzig, which is interesting. Uh, That's where Mm. he's headed in January. Um, That's some like real, like from a talent development and like player point of view, that's like really interesting just because of like, Leipzig's reputation for developing talent and then his reputation for like finding those like under the radar, like not 65 million pound young kid gem players. Like that's, that's a cool move. I like that. As like it's a, a very cool like move. A, and it's one that's gone completely under the radar and not really being talked about. I mean, Klopp has praised Edwards as being kind of the guy behind the scenes that really helps make these big decisions. I mean, look at the players Liverpool's offloaded too for like quite a bit of money. Players yeah, that aren't so really imagine what he like do Harry with, Wilson, like, yep. all those imagine, men. Like, imagine what he can do with like developed talent too. Like, he can make yeah. Leipzig a lot of money. I mean, I don't like thinking about football as strictly a business, but fuck, man, he he could do a pretty good job over there. And that's and what I I'm think, saying. Like, I it's, it's not – sorry to cut you off, Mitch. Yeah, no, it's, go for it's it. It's not surprising that Leipzig are going after him. They're an ambitious, you know – Obviously, the Red Bull ownership, they have money to spend, and he'll do great over there, too, with the young players. Oh, yeah. Boston. But I'm surprised, like, with this project at Newcastle, he wasn't, like, the first man on their list as, like, someone to put behind an Eddie Howe to, like, really get a whole team together. That's true. Yeah, I never thought about it that way before, yeah. Um, what I was going to say was I, I think it's a really good move for Leipzig because of the position that they're in right now. You know, at the start of the season, you have a huge shakeup with your top player getting bought out, your manager getting bought out, and now you have somebody who is proven to develop this talent coming in and picking out good young players to help bolster this side. I think it's I think it's going to turn Leipzig into a couple of monsters, honestly. Mm. Speaking of Leipzig and Europe and whatnot, you guys want to chat about the Champions League? Because uh, it was a fun couple of days. I, I mean, and was it actually? I don't know. It, it was it like was kind of an games, anal- I guess. It wasn't there. I don't think there was anything crazy that happened. But it, I mean, it was a lot of, um, I guess, moving around in the, in the group. So I guess it could be interesting if you're watching, you know, we got two games left in the, in the group stage before we're into the knockouts. um, And it's still a really close race throughout. Yeah. There's some really, really tight groups. Um, We can kick things off with Atlanta man United here. Good two, two draw brace from Cristiano Ronaldo dudes fucking inevitable. I hate it, but he's fucking inevitable. It was it was another game that United didn't deserve to to get points from. They looked sloppy all over the place. Um, uh, uh, I forget who got subbed on um, thirty seven minutes in uh, for United, but have being forced to show their hand early and make those changes and take a different shape, um, get them out of their com- comfort zone. Atalanta came out swinging and. Um, I don't know. I think they deserve to win that game. Yeah, they did what they had to do, too, with, like, coming out hot. Uh, I kind of predicted this in my preview that, you know, to beat Man United, you got to come out hot early. Uh, They scored goals in the first, like, 10 minutes of each half. Uh, It just wasn't enough because, you know, Ronaldo, those one-goal leads aren't going to last against Man United. That is the one thing that kind of keeps them in games. And that is exactly how it played out. Uh, Pretty, you know, 
pretty straightforward result if we're going to be honest too. Yeah, it felt it, – it didn't ever feel like Atalanta were going to win. Like yeah. you – you looked at it and it was like, are they really going to, to pull this one out? Like, and then, you know, Ronaldo scored that goal. And then you, you know, you get to like the later stages of the game and you, I don't know, just like watching this man United side, like even over the past couple of years, like we've been ragging on them a lot, but like even over the past couple of years, like you hit like the 80th and the 90th minute and they're only down by like a goal to a team that like they can probably be, or like snag a goal, you're like, no, nah, it's coming. Where yeah. is it? What when do they score? Is it the 90 plus one? Is it the 90 plus two? Is it the 89th? Like they have a late goal in them, especially against these sides that like aren't necessarily as like high quality as them, but just like give them games. Uh and I, this game just kind of like showed it to a T almost. Yeah. Like they should have won this game. They like should be better than this Atalanta side, but when a Ronaldo scores the second a goal, goal, the United players don't even look like really surprised. It, it wasn't even like I wasn't surprised. I, yeah. I was just like, yeah, f- fucking figures, and there he is. What do you guys think of like this too? Uh, like the snake format in the group stage, it's just kind of like dull to me. You know, they played Atalanta a couple weeks ago, and it's kind of like the same kind of game. Like Ronaldo scores late, and they win. Uh, it just feels weird to play the same team like within two weeks. I, I'm not really a huge fan of it weird but like I think it preps the I think it's good for the players at least to get that like little bit of experience in the group stage that feels like a home and away tie you know what I'm saying that's fair especially for like the number one like maybe it's really only beneficial to like the number one and the number two team that are in the group but giving them the opportunity to like experience that like home and away tie type of atmosphere and like see what happens like tweaking the tactics at home versus away like back to back in games like that like I, I kind of see how it can be beneficial from like a player side of things but like from a fan side of things it's just like oh yeah they're playing them again cool yeah. it'd be more I think it would be cooler if they did like the you just like flip flopped it like okay now you're back to playing who you played the first week so like instead of City going it, you know this is just like because the schedule fresh in my mind for them but instead of City going Leipzig, PSG, Bruges, Bruges, it was Leipzig, PSG, Leipzig, or Leipzig, PSG, Bruges, Leipzig, PSG, Bruges. Like you, you play the same and you just like mm-hmm. flip flop the fixtures over the last three. Yeah, I agree. I just don't, I'm not a huge fan of the, I know it, it does feel like a knockout uh, round, you know, to a little extent, but I, it's just, eh, it's the group stage get, and it just feels yeah. ingenuine. Until you get one versus four, and it's just fucking two drubbings back to back, and you're like, this was fucking boring. Speaking of a crazy home and away uh, fixture, we have to talk about Liverpool and that Letty Klopp doing the double on Simeone. What do you guys think about that Simeone ball done and dusted? I think you guys, yeah, I think you guys must be loving that shit. I am buzzing. Um, Man of the match, Trent. I mean, played out of his mind. Um, you know, it wasn't our strongest 11 out there. Uh, Simicast stepped up and, and put on a great performance as well. Uh, I think it shows a lot of what we have to offer in terms of, you know, they caught us off guard last year and we got the necessary pieces to put in place to go out and blank them which feels fucking unbelievable feels so Listen, good a 2-0 anytime, win against Simeone feels so good anytime terrorist ball doesn't win I am happy I don't care that it's Liverpool getting three points at the end of the day not just getting three points solidifying their spot in the knockouts in what it felt like it should have been a harder group, too. Can we talk about that, too? Like, that was, I was terrified. was buzzing this group up as the group of death, as the closest group, and Liverpool have already qualified. Uh, Milan just blows, dude. I, I don't know. I know Milan's second in Serie A right now. They stink big time. Yeah, they're just like, what is – I don't get it, man. I don't get it. Like, whatever. It's the Champions League. Who the fuck knows what could happen? But, like, I don't get it. It's crazy to me that that's how that panned out. 
I mean, when you look at it from afar, like, you, you know, we just mentioned Milan kind of blows in Europe this year. Porto, Liverpool dominate against. And you're going against an Atleti side that Liverpool is seeking a revenge against. And plus you have Allison, who, you know, Adrian started those two games against them uh, a couple of years ago. So it's like three teams that like Liverpool, I feel like has a pretty good edge on. Uh, Atletico right. is obviously the hardest two games, but, you know, Klopp went out and just outclassed Simeone. I mean, the tactics were spot on. Like Mitch, I mean, it, the changes, you know, there was a few of them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. All of them were great. Costas was great. I thought the Ox had a surprisingly good game last night. It's good to see him out there, you know, getting 70 minutes of good football under his belt. And, and Trent, just phenomenal. Two kind of, uh, the second one might not be a cross, might be more of a low driven shot, but Mane finishes it. And that's all that really matters. Uh, just superb from the boys. And I mean, realistically, you're the better side too. Sorry to cut you yeah, off, but no, like you're realistically, fine. you're the better side. Like yep. to me, watching that tie with them last year versus, uh, you know, the athletic Liverpool tie in the, no, the COVID year, sorry, not last year, but the COVID year when you guys, when, when they beat you, like, you didn't have that, that was no Van Dyke, right? That was the no Van Dyke year. No, no, that was last year. Allison was missing. Allison, right? Was out. So you're missing a, a key piece in an area that, like, matters obviously <laughs> matters, especially going against a counter attacking side that, like, needs to take their chances. Yeah. Your second choice goalie is in net. Like, I guess credit where credit's due to Atleti for the way they played that tie, they, they managed it well, but. If you're full strength, I, I still think you beat them. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But. Yeah, and especially without Griezmann, uh, Thomas Lamar. I believe they were missing someone else too yesterday. At Anfield, that's a tough task, and Liverpool should be expected to win that game. Right, uh, yeah, exactly. They bossed it. And one, one more shout-out, Diago Jota. I mean, scoring that goal and just the emotion that came out of him. Scoring against a club and manager that never gave him a chance. Uh, love to see that. He's just that a top cool. lad. That is cool. All right. Well, I guess we can talk about City for a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> I expected to lose this game. I don't really know why. After the Crystal Palace loss, uh, I, I expected to lose this game like like fully. I was I work with a I have a coworker who's also a City fan, and I messaged him before. And I mean, this is like a little preview to how I feel about the preview this weekend. But I, I sent him a little message on like our work messaging channel, and I was like ready to lose to Bruges and then help Ole keep his job this weekend. And he was like, "Fuck yeah, dude." He was like 2-0 Bruges today, 2-0 uh, to United tomorrow, own goal, and Ronaldo penalty in the 90th minute. So I, I was not super confident about this game. We kind of played like dog shit against Crystal Palace. So going into this game and seeing him really bounce back uh, was nice. Going in, we went into the half at 1-1. Um, came out in the second half, fucking a totally different team. Um a couple of things I have noticed uh, about this city side and in regards to a couple of players, uh, one Jack Grealish has got to stop playing as the left on the left as the inverted winger. If he doesn't have like a natural wide winger on the right, it just doesn't work. And, and with Cancelo being an inverted fullback too, like they both want to occupy the same exact areas of the pitch on the left. And he just does not look very good uh, as a left winger. I think he might look better with a striker, too because like create creatively he's been good he's been creating a lot of chances he looks dangerous but like he's just super predictable and he has no assistance not having uh, a natural left back so I, I was like kind of on the fence with Grealish um he moved centrally around like the 70th minute and then created two chances and like two big chances in 20 minutes one that led to Cancelo hitting the post um I, I think he needs to play centrally or play with Raheem Sterling on the right, like a more natural winger to give him that ability to come in and like still have width. Um, but I thought we looked really good in the second half. Uh, you guys big up your boy, Trent Alexander Arnold. Uh, I'm going to big up my boy, Jao Cancelo. You know, I think those are the two best fullbacks, uh, especially attacking wise right now. Um, I think Trent really picked up his dip in form he had last season. In my opinion, I don't think he was at his highest level last season, but this season he's been phenomenal. And um, I, I personally believe that Cancelo is the best fullback in Europe right now. And a hat trick of assists last night, I think just shows it. It's Bare tough to argue forward. with that point. I mean, no, you can just make one, an argument for Trent, but it's hard to say that he's better than Cancelo overall right now. I, I will concede that. I think he can do it on both sides too, which only helps yep. Cancelo. He's a left back and a right back. I mean, hat trick of assists from the left back spot. And then like two weeks ago, we had a goal and an assist and a man of the match performance for right back. So 
He's super complete. Um, I kind of hate Tishi and the way he's done a lot of our negotiations, but we fucking robbed Juventus blind in the deal for Cancelo. Absolutely robbed him blind. Gave him Danilo and $20 million, and we got the best fullback in Europe. It was... Yeah, you got to tip your... I tick my hat. Tip my hat to you, Tishi. Two things. Sign us a fucking striker now. First thing... Big ups to you, uh, for to City for scoring five goals in in that game against Bruges. Yo, did you see the own goal though? It did was you dog see shit. The own goal. <laughs> yes, Bernardo went to block a cross, bounced off his foot, hit Stones in the fucking face. Yep. And like, Stones just had to sit there and it's just try unlucky. It, it it's is. Just it unlucky. Just, it was just wrong place, wrong time. Um, I mean, it is what it is. I thought we still looked pretty good though, which and, was, it was nice to see us bounce back like that after a, a loss. So, so in regards to the Jack Grealish talk, um, you know, it, this is a very important to me personally because um, I have his once to watch card in my foot 22 ultimate team. Don't <laughs> expect wonder, a lot of inform. Just, that card, just, buddy. just wondering what you would do uh, to, to get him an inform. I would. So my personal opinion is Grealish in this city side is better served centrally. I think he made his name for Villa on the left, but the way this city side play, he's going to get that freedom that made him so dangerous at Villa through the middle for City. I think with De Bruyne out of form right now, especially, you play Gundogan, or not Gundogan, sorry, you play Bernardo Silva, Rodri in that double pivot that's been working all season, and you play Grealish, just that attacking-minded central midfielder in front of them, and it's Phil Foden, Gabriel Jesus and Mares or Raheem Sterling on the right. And I, I think that's how you bring the best out of Grealish right now. Um, that or he has to start with a, with a natural left back. He has to start with like a Zinchenko or something like that. A left-footed left back who's going to provide that width and let him more comfortably come inside and give him an overlapping option. So it, it's not as predictable when he cuts inside what he's going to do. Um I think that is where he's finding the issues right now is as talented as he is and, and as good as he has been, he it's, it's tough for him to shine given the circumstances that he's in on the left. Uh, that being said, he linked up with Cancelo and Foden really, really well the entire time he was on the pitch. So I think Grealish is suffering from first season at Man City winger syndrome. We all saw how bad Mares was his first season. We all saw how bad Sané was his first season, and then mm-hmm. he won PFA Young Player of the Year. So I think give Grealish a season. Sané's he's still in this year at Bayern, too. Hey, dude, dude, I absolutely love to see that. We can talk about them in just a second when we when we get into this other stuff here, man. But, like, I, I am so happy to see him come back from that injury, like, better than ever. Like, in the Champions League, it's four goals, four assists in four games. So, like, I am so happy to see Leroy Ballin again. Moving on to PSG and Leipzig. Yo, who said City was going to top this group? <clears throat> Crickets. Who said City's going to top this group? And uh, who's who's first in the group right now? Um, it might have been you. And uh, who's first in the group? Who's 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 first? Who's uh, who's let, top of the group? Because let me do some PSG. research. It's uh, it's, uh, it's it's Man City. We're on nine points. PSG are on eight because they beat yep, us. Yep, so yep, I, yep, I did the research yep. for you. Yep, yeah, yep. So another game that PSG were not really the better team, and and in my opinion, felt a little fortunate to come away with a point. They had two goals. They got a late penalty. They conceded a late penalty against Leipzig. Um, I I, I don't think PSG are that good personally. It, it, was, a, it was a flat performance. Huge performance for Genie. Love to see that. Uh, I will support Genie Wijnaldum scoring two goals for PSG. Yeah. Hate to Any see him carrying week. a team with Neymar, Mbappe, SD. and Di Maria. Yo, <laughs> shout out uh, the Red Bull Leipzig social media guy. After seeing the uh, reports that Messi was out injured for the game and doing his obligatory, all right, so that just means checks notes. Mbappe and Neymar to deal with. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it. I think Leipzig really showed a lot of heart. Um, it was a. It was a really, I think, solid performance from them. They came out of the gate swinging, um, looking very threatening right out uh, off the bat. Um, 
Josh, what are your thoughts here? Uh, yeah, PSG aren't that good, and they're not going to win the Champions League, one. Uh, two, and Kunku scored again. That man is a baller. He is having a season at Leipzig. He is going to get picked up by a big club this summer. He already has, like, 15 goal contributions this year. Didn't get called up by France, though. What the fuck? Do you, what does he have to do? To Dude, get a French call football to be is more corrupt than the Olympics. They, they have such Mbappe. a strategy to picking players. It's I would I no have, wait in that for me. Yeah, I have no idea how he doesn't get a call up to that French national team. No idea. He's going to get picked up. I, th- I don't know if he's going to the Prem or maybe, you know, Bayern. I, I don't see him fitting in well at Bayern, but he's going to a big club this summer. No doubt about it. Absolutely. That. He's, like, way too talented to not be, be picked up by, like, the best of the best. Yeah, 100%. and Leipzig yeah. don't even look like they're – I mean, I don't think they're in a Champions League spot right now. No. No, I don't think they're having a particularly great season over in the Bundesliga right now. They have not, uh, not bounced back from uh, – <laughs> From the devastation that uh, Byron created. <laughs> we'll go on to the next game here. Barca uh, and Kiev. We just had this one in here. That, you know, Barca won one nothing. Uh, Ansu Fati is kind of back in the team, making some noise, scored in the 72nd minute. Uh, what do you guys think of Ansu Fati? I think he's super fucking talented. I'm actually, I've been a big Fati fan, you know, since he got his first team debut for, for Barca. I think he's very, very good. Um, I think he is next up for this Barcelona team. Um, I like him a lot. I think he's really, really good. And also, it's – yeah, he, he shouted out my guy Aguero with his celebration. So, I love him. I think he's the player that we were sold on for Dembele. <laughs> he's he's like the real Dembele. Who was Dude, hurt again, seen, by the way? Injury have you report. seen Dembele's injury history since leaving D- Dortmund, though, man? That's so sad to see. Bro, it is he was sad. so good. He was a demon. He was a demon for that Dortmund team, man. He had like 17 goals and 12 assists in that breakout year for Dortmund. And then just to see him plagued by injuries, bro, it, may, it makes me really sad. I was a really big Dembele fan, too. It's what happens when you sell your soul to the literal devil. Excuse me. I don't know about all that, but... <laughs> That's what happens just, when you go to Barcelona, man. It's you. I don't know. Find the it contract out for over. Messi just fine. He no, Lionel Messi was homegrown. That's different. He he made Barcelona. It's okay. <laughs> Exception it worked out for some people. All right, man. Like I get it. I get the it. list is probably Twitter, if, if you gave chill. me time. The list is probably just as long for people who didn't work out for as the list that okay who did really well. I'm not gonna refute that. At all. I won't argue with you there. So we'll call this uh, a draw, but I am Leipzig because I deserve to win. Fair enough. Anywho. Moving uh, on. Ajax Dortmund, dude. Ajax are the fucking real deal. Ten Hag has these guys twice in a row in Europe. And Ajax are good. They are running away with this group. Ten Hag has a, them firing on all cylinders. They're fucking so good, dude. I like – I want Ten Hag to replace Pep one day. He's fucking so good. He's playing with just like a fucking mismatch of players, dude. Holler, who just like didn't work out at West Ham. He has defended – like his center backs are both under fucking six feet tall. He's just like balling out, man balling out like with the with this i gotta put this on it for emphasis for all of you watching on youtube he is just fucking so good and he's got this ajax team playing with a fearlessness that anybody who draws them in the next round should be scared should be very i was always a little confused by the hilaire move because i thought he was really good at west ham like especially last year in like the first half of the season I was surprised that West Ham were so willing to get rid of him. Uh, he didn't and he's, score that many goals, did he? I yeah. think that was like their biggest problem. They, he was like, dude, he doesn't score. Get him out of here. To be fair, it's worked out for them with, you know, Antonio getting the load up top. But uh, Okay, yeah, but Ajax are undefeated in the Champions League, so I think it's worked out well for both parties. Yeah, so I don't want to take anything away from Ajax, but is this more of a case of Dortmund just being like historically bad in the past? Like, I feel like the past year and a half, it's just been – 
wow, Erling Holland good, team bad. I it's think all- Holland, Holland. I think you right. I think you right, and I think Holland being injured right now is really showing where the cracks are for the Dortmund side. They're I so mean, they're, old and boring, man. They're tied on points with Sporting at this point with two games to go. I mean, it's it's kind of it's it's getting dangerous for them, and mm-hmm. you know it sucks to see because there's a lot of talent in that side. And it's going to be an interesting finish to the group. For it sure. is that that I definitely have my eyes on Group C, and I definitely, definitely have my eyes on groups F and G. There's only two points separating first and first through third in all of those or in uh, all three of those groups. So it's going to be really, really um, tight and very competitive these last two games of the group stage. Oh, yeah. And group B is going to be tight, too, with this Milan. So Milan's pretty much done, so. But Atleti have a chance of not making it to the knockout round. It's probably going to come down to Porto on the last day in Ooh. in Portugal at the Drago. That is going to be at the Drago with Atletico Madrid and Porto has all the makings of like the most, you know, vile, most antics sideline action game of all time. It's going to be literally. Oh, much- yeah. Television. That game's gonna be crazy. That game's Pepe, gonna be Pepe crazy. at the back again for Porto. He he kind of knows the whole deal. I mean, that is going to be hysterical to watch. You might need I to have to sign a wait. waiver. You might have to yeah. sign a waiver to watch that game. Honestly, I literally cannot wait for that game. The environment's gonna be incredible too. I mean, those Portugal fans are nuts. Like yeah, it's gonna be sick. It's crazy the difference a year makes. Having fans back has been such a life-changing experience. You know what I mean? Like, it just – it makes it so – it makes it what it is. And in a game like that, when it's down to the wire, you're you're trying to get to the knockout stages of the Champions League and a team – a team like Atleti going up against a a Porto side that definitely – I wouldn't say definitely. I, I would say shouldn't necessarily be in this position. Atleti should have some more strength over them. A few more points picked up in the opening games of the groups. So it, it, it's going to be a nail biter. It's going to be interesting. I think every soccer fan is going to be every, every soccer fan should be watching this game. Is and, that us maybe not giving uh, Porto enough credit though, saying that like they shouldn't be in this position and like, it shouldn't be that close. Is that, I, I they think clearly you are a like, side. No, they're not. And I, I, I guess it's more of rating Atletico. I, th- I think That's it's fair. just, I think, I don't, I, I think Porto's a great side. I just think Atletico. I think we're all class manager. Not, they not have saying that at all. bigger weapons, but, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's going to be interesting, but ultimately the cracks that Klopp was able to expose, Porto, you know, putting on the performances that they've been able to to put together. Obviously, a draw against Milan isn't ideal going into a game like that, but I think they have the tools necessary to beat Atletico, but I, right. I don't think it's going to happen. I think I agree. I think at the end of the day, I think Atleti still get out of the group, but it's going to come right down to the wire. So it'll be a fun one to watch. Um, anything else we wanted to, to chat about here, the Champions League, or are we ready to tuck into what's going on this weekend? I do have to say I did call Sevilla going back down to the Europa League. That yeah, is, you did. That is on I pace, and I, I said that even though they are one of the best teams, in that, I mean, that's that was the wide open group. I mm-hmm. said that Sevilla have no chance and they are going to the Europa League because that is where they are meant to be. And, you know, fate presumed. He's not good at betting this weekend, but he don't miss when he's Hold talking on. shit about Sevilla. Hold on. Isn't, isn't, Wolfs- isn't Wolfsburg in third right now? 
are they? They're gonna have to third? fight for the Europa League. Oh shit! They have, that's oh, even damn. better content. I forgot about even that. better. Wolfsburg, yeah, Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg is in third. Sevilla fighting to keep their Europa League hopes alive. Ugh. Is how that headline reads. I hate them. <laughs> I think they're funny. That's how I feel about them. I think they're funny. I still haven't Fair. forgave what's his name for that stupid tackle at Fenway Park on and the Yasser Larushi. I don't even Yo, remember who it was. That I was a fucking that head. game at Fenway Park. Dude, Dude, we, had such, we had such a good angle for that goal. I liked uh, the fact that. I was in a crowd full of Liverpool fans in a France away shirt rooting for Sevilla. Okay, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> I was having a lot of fun yeah, for yeah, someone yeah. who everybody around me hated. All right. Uh, how do you guys feel about uh, – Let's. okay, well, I'll preface where we're going with this here. Uh, preview time. Jumping into this weekend here. Uh, so first game, uh, let us kind of get this one out of the way, it's, but it is a little interesting. I will say it is interesting. Uh, Liverpool West Ham. What are we thinking guys? Do you guys feel good about this game? Do you feel not very good about this game? I personally feel like West Ham might be able to pull a fast one on somebody on, on the folks. I think this is the game. I think this is the game that it happens to, to Liverpool. Um, unfortunately, I think, yes, they they had a frustrating draw um, with Gank, but I mean, Antonio's playing out of his mind. He like he's he's picking up that pace again after a few cold weeks. Um, we were kind of switching the side out again. We're, we're still flip flopping people in uh, in midfield. We're without Nabby Lad and Milner. Um, Tiago and Fabinho back. Um, and then there's some questions at, uh, at left back as well. Uh, fuck you, Mitch. You always make me be the homer and pick Liverpool. I, you make me seem like the biased guy. Uh, Liverpool have lost like 24 games. They're, I don't think they're going to lose here, but you know, West Ham are going to put up a fight. I think Liverpool are always more susceptible to drop points against kind of the iffy sides like Brighton, the teams in the middle that can keep that one goal difference and then snag a goal at the end and get a point. The teams that like the Leicesters and the West Hams, I think Liverpool always match up good against because West Ham are going to go out and they're going to go for the game and that's just going to make the game more open. Uh, gives more room for Trent to play balls into. Liverpool always play well against those teams in the kind of um, eight to five ranges in the Premier League. Uh, I think they go out and I think they get three points. I would start Costa Simicos at left back. I think he has earned a run of games. That's not you saying think so because he's in my fantasy team, dude. Should I keep him in? Should yeah, I keep you him should. In? You should. I. I really genuinely think that Andy Robertson is the best left back in world football. That doesn't mean that he uh, has a lock at starting every week. Costas okay. has come in, and when a player has came in and put in performances like he has, he deserves a run of games, and he played great against Atleti in the, the Champions League, and I think he is the best fit for a match like this where – you're going to be putting a lot of balls into the box, having both him and Trent, where Andy's crossing has been a little bit off. I think he slots in there. Fabinho is a huge, huge addition to this game. Without Fabinho, I'd be a little bit scared. He just sweeps everything up, man. I, I don't know if West Ham's going to be able to break us down like that. And the, the okay. addition to have Tiago coming in too, maybe he even starts, gets a game. I don't see Liverpool losing this match, and I have the money line, mon minus 145. Obviously heavily favoring Liverpool, but like I said, they haven't lost in like 24 games, man. I, I just don't see it happening. All right, I'm keeping Simikas. I'm starting him this weekend, so you're going to fucking hear from me. <laughs> I can't wait he to hear how that game. plans out. You're going to hear from me if he has a bad game, Josh. I just want you to know that. We have a group chat for the main stand. You're going to hear from me. I'm putting uh my... I'll give you. I'll give you a, a second reason you should start Simi Cass. I think with the month of games we have coming up and the importance in them, um, we have Arsenal um, on the twentieth, 
four days later, we have Porto. Three days later, we have Southampton. And then December 1st, Merseyside Derby. So I think with those four matches coming after the West Ham game, Robbo, whether he's just not finding his footing, not finding the pass, whatever it may be, I, like like you guys said, he's the best left back in the world at the moment. Just giving him that little extra time, rest, because he was our workhorse last year. He played the most out of any player on our side. So I think just giving him or giving Simicast the run of games, he's earned it. Let Robbo sit for a little bit, and then he can come in and, and play in the, the bigger fixtures coming up. Um, throughout the rest of the month. Yep. Okay. You guys have sold me. Simikas gets in my starting 11 this weekend. Speaking of Merseyside, right. we got Everton and Tottenham too. There's some pretty good matches in the Premier League this weekend, actually. Uh, Fuck yeah. I, I'm not sure I'm if actually... Conte managed tonight against Vitesse in the conference. He did. he did. He did? Yep. It was Okay, well, yep. so we'll have his second game here against Everton. It's kind of a cool little test for him. Everton aren't a bad side, but Rafa's had a little bit of frustration lately. Do you guys think this is a, an easy win for Tottenham? I think with Conte being familiar with the Premier League already, mm -hmm. it, it might be like him getting, you know, finding his feet with this Tottenham side for the first time. But what the league tends – so maybe if Conte had never managed in the Premier League before, I would be more apt to go for, for Everton in this game. But with Everton kind of being in – not a funk, but Rafa and, and the side, like you mentioned – having some frustrations. You know, they got piped by Watford last week. Um, I think Tottenham is a safe pick, like I said, especially with with uh, with Conte having, like, an, like, knowing what the Premier League is all about already coming in with his new Tottenham side. Yeah. The Tottenham odds plus 150 just to win outright are insane, too. For a, You know, teams always play well when a new manager comes in, you'd think. Uh, so I favor Tottenham in this. Um, another good Premier League match, Leeds and Leicester City. Talk about two offensive teams. What do you oh, guys Leicester are going to fucking murder them. I yeah. think Leicester are going to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, Leeds have just been so suspect at the back, and Leicester love playing on the counterattack, man. I think Leicester are going to kill them. I think BLS is going to be done after this year. Dude, I I've had a lot of conversations with, um, with I mean, our friend Cam. Um, I've had conversations with him and like he said Leeds might get relegated and like at first I thought he was kind of crazy for saying that but like they kind of suck I don't can think they get, get I don't think they suck bad enough to get relegated well can yeah we, but they suck yeah they're not good they're like defensively they're a fucking mess back there man like they're gonna score goals so they'll like I think they'll get enough to stay up because like their forwards and Bielsa's like thinking is good enough to beat those like kind like mid like lower mid table sides who are like yeah we can go out and play against them like it's just leads you know what i'm saying yeah. and i think that they'll beat those sides but like i think Leicester are going to rip them open dude i really do i i i'm saying like maybe 3-0 4-1 like i think Leicester kill them I was thinking three one. I would love to hear Cameron's opinion on the next game if we could get him on a on a phone call. All right, uh, and so Mitchell, as you were saying, I uh, would love to get Cameron in here for the Derby preview. And you know what we went and did? We went and did just that. So Cameron, how about you go hey ahead guys. and uh, introduce yourself? Hey guys, I've uh, been a United fan since I was about 12 years old. Took a trip to London and only recognized a Rooney jersey, bought it, and have loved the team ever since. Uh, so I came in towards the uh, shittier end of, you know, United's run. I got to see one championship, and then it's just been piss ever since with, you know, David Moyes and then Louis Van Gaal, and onward to the sadness that we have today. Yo, so. Cam, what do you mean piss? You got prime Fellini ball. <laughs> Dude, we've talked about this to extent, and I would love to hear Josh and Mitchell's take on this, but outside of the banter, watching Fellaini just ping balls off his forehead was actually highly entertaining for like a three-year span, even though it was dog shit. Back in high school, one of my buddies used to like Man United, and I used to always banter him with just the Fellaini talk. It was the, the funnest thing to do. Are you a fan of David Moyes? 
So I have a difficulty with David Moyes. He wasn't given enough time at United, but I also think that him at West Ham is the right place for him because this, we all can admit the spotlight at teams like Liverpool, United, Real Madrid is just so much brighter than anywhere else. And I don't know if he would have been able to handle that. He seemed to struggle with the spotlight. So I don't think he was given enough time, but also at the same point, I don't think he was the right fit for the club. Do you think Zaha slept with his daughter? <laughs> I fucking hope he did. <laughs> I mean, dude, man, this has just been a bad like two week span for United banter with the Paul Skull shit, yeah. man. Oh, what flavor do you think his daughter's toenails are? Oh, dude, grape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, All man. right, Cam. There's a What's reason up? you're fucking here, and you know what that reason is? Because you guys are gonna dick us on Saturday. No, nah, dude, you're going to win. We're the home team, and you're literally going to win. All right, so I did write some stuff down for this because I, I wanted to take this as seriously as possible. I've Way always given... more prepared than we are on this podcast. <laughs> That's fair. Anyway. I, I take this stuff seriously when you guys ask me to bring the heat. Um, Ole is only behind Graham Potter in beating Pep. Graham's done it five times. Ole's done it four. But why I think you guys will beat us. Pogba's still suspended. We just lost Veron for a month. Um, Slabhead looks like dog shit. I mean, like, I don't know if looks any of you like, guys... Looks yeah. like dog shit or is dog shit. That's a really tough question, because he was really good for us last year, and he was really good at the Euros, and I don't know necessarily what's happened in the past four months that he looks shambolic. Like, it's just bad at this point. Um, Damn, why is he still wearing the captain's armband at this point? That is a question I do not have an answer to, because for me, the two people who should be wearing the armband are either Bruno or Cavani. And Cavani's kind of a wild choice here, but when you watch Cavani step on the pitch for United, there's nothing but, like, I'm going to say red blood coming out of him like everyone else, but Manchester United blood coming out of him. That dude runs for every ball like it's the last ball he'll ever chase, and that's the kind of energy that I absolutely need in my club. And then Bruno from day one has just been, a rock solid and B in love with Manchester United and has done nothing but spoke highly of the club. So I think one of those two really needs to get the armband at this point. Yeah, fair enough. I think from a completely non banter standpoint, Bruno should be your captain. Yeah, I do too, because I think Cavani ends up leaving us this summer. Anyways, he wanted to leave at the end of this summer, but has spoken on the fact that he liked playing for United and putting the shirt on meant a lot to him. So he was going to stay for an extra year. I think with Ronaldo coming back, um, him staying was less important. So I think he'll end up leaving at the end of the summer anyways. Um, so I have, I have a couple, maybe not a couple things, but before we really tuck into the, um, the preview, because like ultimately sure. I would like to, to get our conversation about how we, we actually feel the game is going to go. Yeah. Um, I, ha- I have one other question for you, and it's just with recent events coming out. Um, yeah. How do you feel about with, with all – uh, going to Ronaldo apparently and being like, I want you to be the guy to mm. like wear the armband or whatever, like be the the leader in the dressing room. And Ronaldo yeah. being like, and no. And then Scott McTominay stepping up with the, with the captain talk kind of coming. Sure. Do you think that that maybe maybe Scott? Because you and I have had some conversations that are not yeah. <laughs> recorded in this sphere. I know your opinions on Scott McTominay. Mm. Um, how do you feel about a his willing apparent willingness to be that guy for United? Uh, and B, do you think that maybe one day he could be the right guy for mm. that? I love Scott because he's a local lad that's gone through our system, um, and he really does. He's like a Cavani at this point. He bleeds Manchester United, and I I, I love people that are like that. Um, the thing that concerns me about Scott is he seems he and Fred work so well together. I think because neither of them know what the hell a midfielder actually is supposed to do. And (laughs) both of them are sixes and eights and tens all at the same time. And none in none of the above. So like the thing that concerns me about Scott is he's not Michael Carrick. He's not a six. He's not a Paul Scholes and a true eight. He can't Bruno and be a 10. Like, I don't know where he fits and he does a lot of things well, but he doesn't do anything great. So he's a really good squad player 
And I really like Scott. You know I love Scott McTominay, and I would love for him to wear the armband. But the problem is the person who wears the armband has to play 50 games a year if that's if those are the competitions you're in. And I don't know if Scott's that player to play 50 games a year. Um, that's fair. But as far as passion goes, I don't think anyone is as passionate about United as Scott is, and I, I love that. Um, but yeah. Uh, can I say can a I... few things on Scott McTominay? Sure. So, one – Mick Fred is awful. Two, <laughs> Scott McTominay uh, right now is what Jordan Henderson was when we almost sold him to Fulham for Clint Dempsey. Mm-hmm. Um, Yo, best American player of all time. <laughs> Continue. And three, of course he wants to be the captain of Manchester United. I would want to be the captain of Liverpool. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean I am equipped. I mean, also at the same point, though, Josh, if United came and said, hey, you want to be our captain, you put that armband on, too. I think captaining yeah. a team, any team, is just like it's the pinnacle of someone's career. So um, no, I, I obviously to suck me, bleed blue till I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you say that until they're like, hey, Pat, here's half a million dollars a week. Get out of your grandparents. I say, home. wait, is City offering me anything? And then I would accept. OK, fair enough. I, I like that comparison of, of Scott McTominay pre Jordan Hend- or early Jordan Henderson phase. I, I just I don't know where he ends up in his career, and he could be meteoric and be one of the better midfielders I've ever seen play the game, or he could just continue doing what he's doing. Um, he needs to break the McFred shit because if he doesn't, and if he's tied to Fred the rest of his career, it it scares me. Yeah. I think I think McTominay did Fred have a decent shit. Fred is dog shit and is very easily manhandled with one arm. Um, but I think McTominay actually had a pretty um, decent performance uh, midweek. Uh, he at, had against a Atlanta. rock solid game against Tottenham. He was the yeah, reason he was really good against, against Tottenham. Tottenham. He was really, and really Tottenham, good against yes. Tottenham. I was just more recency biased because I was yeah. just watching, watching that game. Um, okay, so – you watched the game against Atalanta. Did you see how bad Slabhead was towards the end of the game where <laughs> he got awful. caught on the ball with it, like just in between his feet and he just like stood there. It's, it's, it's like when, when you sneak up on a goat and just like scare it <laughs> and it goes stiff. Yep. Like watching, like I've been hyper-focused on Maguire the last few weeks, uh, especially leading up to the Liverpool game. And I just, watching him it's like he doesn't want to be on the pitch he's acting like harry kane if harry kane was a center back Mm. it's like he has the ability he knows what he's doing but he's just not producing he's Mm. consistently pulled out of position and i don't think it's all on him i think the the line that he plays with now with the injury to varan um you know i think i think a lot of it is around him but, I mean, if you're wearing that captain's armband, you need to be stepping up. You need to be making those crucial tackles. You need to be in the right position. And he's just not there. Yep. I, I got a question for you guys. Could this be a case of him just overplaying the game? Um, cause Absolutely. He wasn't, uh, Absolutely he wasn't it is. This bad last year. And, you know, I, I think last year is first year really. And he just kind of took on the role and was like, this is what it is. And I'll go for it. But this year, I think he felt the pressure more, and I think he's just overplaying it and thinking too much. Well, I mean, I mean, ultimately, yes, there is a tax on English players. Let's just get that out of the way right now. But there is a reason Lester valued him at what they valued him and mm-hmm. why you bought him at what you bought him for and why Man City were so heavily in for him before he ultimately went to you guys. I, I think – Maguire is one of those players. Um, I'm going to compare him to a player I'm very familiar with in John Stones. Maguire, to me, feels a lot like John Stones when he's confident. Dude is on top of the fucking world. He was phenomenal for Leicester when he was their captain and he was getting all of these links to these big clubs and he was playing out of his mind for them. Really similar to John Stones. In, in City Centurion season, and then last year when he had an assured partner next to him. I think Maguire, a lot of these English players are like this, where you mix in the media and their price tag 
and all of these other things, it genuinely makes it hard for these guys to play the game. So, like, yes, I'm going to banter Harry Maguire until the end of time because he's got a big forehead and he's a fucking refrigerator. But ultimately, there's a lot of pressure on these English Mm -hmm. guys. And when they're riding high, they're really riding high and and they show where their value is. But they're so – they they, – the outside influences into their game, I think, affect a lot of these English guys a lot more than a majority of players that play in the top flight. And I I think that doesn't get maybe talked about enough or – or looked at enough, like what goes into Harry Maguire being as bad as he is this season in comparison to how he's been in the past. So Mm. I think he's a fridge and I think he fucking sucks this year, but I think there is a window for him to turn it around if he gets a competent partner and probably is no longer the captain of Manchester United. I think those two things will help him a lot in the long run. I think the yeah. big thing for me is you can't discount being the captain of the team that loses a Europa League final, and then you go to the Euros and make the final and lose that. I think the pressure of losing two finals back-to-back can really mess with someone's head. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we're – honestly, we're seeing that firsthand. Yep. Uh, but, all right, Cam, let's get into what we're really here for. Uh, Honest thoughts. <laughs> Three on nothing this city. Weekend. Yeah, you know, I said we were gonna lose because I was kind of joking. I think we're gonna win. I think two nothing, three nothing city. Um, I'll hit my quick points here. United can't keep a clean sheet to save their goddamn lives, and we just lost probably our best defender. Luke Shaw is the Rex Grossman of soccer. Um, and for <laughs> all you, f- I I knew one football fan would get that. Either he's the most hot individual on the face of the planet, or he's ice cold as the Arctic. Um, and currently Shaw is frozen. Um, outside of that, I think center back pairings, iffy with Ron getting hurt, Pogba suspended. I think our only hope to win the game is to play counterattacking. And I think Pep is smart enough to realize that and will probably put something together. I think you guys have a superior midfield and defensive core. I don't think our strike partnership will overcome that. I think 2 nothing, 3 nothing, City. I agree with most of your points i definitely think you're scoring because ederson has paper hands so you're getting one i think two i think three one Mm. is like what i want to say but at the same time we're so weird in front of goal Mm. so it, it it feels like a two one to me i think ultimately city come away with the three points and we duck this stupid little fucking all having Pep's number bullshit that I have just been plagued by as a city fan for the past <laughs> couple of years. Um, I, I think we, I think if we start the midfield, we should start. Uh, we dominate the game from start to finish. Um, we're going to have all the possession. You're going to hit us on the counter attack. Um, yeah. I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head for the most part. I just think you're going to end up getting a goal. Um, also, I, I think Phil Foden, is a, a, a chew in to get a goal. I think Foden gets on the score sheet. And if we're making super early predictions, uh, I think I'm going to early predict Phil Foden also getting a man of the match award this weekend. Ooh. I think that's I, I be... can see that. <sighs> I have a weird out one. of his fucking mind, dude. Yeah. I usually, so I'm a plus odds guy. I never like taking like the, the chalk pick just because I don't see the value in it. This one has not great odds, so minus 205. So you got to put a lot of money down on this, but I would put my bank account on this happening. Manchester City to get the first goal. Man United have been Mm. so bad at the start of games lately. Mm. It's just bound to happen that Man City is going to get the first goal. Uh, That's my bet here. Um, I I think City do walk away with three points, though, too, so. Fred Screamer in the fifth minute. You heard it here first, Dude, folks. If Fred <laughs> scores a goal on Man City, Pastor Fred, baby, I will not be on the next episode. Cam will be the new co-host. <laughs> Dude, the weird thing about the weird thing about Man United and also Ol is that <laughs> they do just enough to like when they have a string of shitty performances, they'll get a big win, and everyone's like, "Oh, like." Are they back? <laughs> and this is like a game where you could see them like come out and like 
dude we win like two nothing and it'll just be like what is going on they're so volatile like that i i don't know you know i I know i just said man city's gonna walk away with three points but this is just how this man united side operates it's like one hide yeah i don't know we're gonna fucking lose this weekend aren't we city's gonna fucking lose here's my thing this is what i talked to (sighs) mitch about i uh, with the Liverpool game, I was like, all's under pressure. United win against Liverpool just on banter 3 nothing, or we lose tremendously like 8 nil. Like, it's it, – and that's the way I feel about the City game. I think it's going to be a 3 nothing, but I also wouldn't be surprised if we walk away winners. For, like, it just – Jekyll and Hyde's a perfect way to describe the team under all. I think a lot of our derbies have also, in some way, been decided in the first 10 minutes of the game. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not even necessarily a goal, but it's like the pace of the game. Like if City come out flying in the first 10 minutes, make like three chances, and they like De Gea makes a crazy save. Like uh, the 2-0 you guys had a couple of years ago, for example. Mm. De Gea makes a crazy save. We miss a chance. Rashford scores on like your second counterattack of the game. And precedence has been set since the first five minutes. City are going to miss all their chances. United are going to be the more clinical team. Th- that's just like the the storyline, so to speak, of our, our past few encounters. And I, this weekend feels like it's going to be a lot of the same. I think um, to drill it down even further, I think the entirety of the game rests upon the Aaron Wambasaka phil Foden matchup. I think whoever comes out with that wins the game. Uh, is Phil Foden going to be our left winger is the question, or does he that's fall fair. sign it? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I mean, realistically, I, was... I think right now Aaron Juan Basaka has the best of Jack Grealish if he ends up starting on the left, but I also okay. don't want Jack Grealish to start this weekend. Really? I do not want Jack Grealish to start this weekend because I want Cancelo to start, and mm. I don't want Jack Grealish to be our left winger if Cancelo is going to be our left back. I want Foden out there because mm. I think Foden will do what he does to every other fullback and eat Juan Basaka because – I genuinely think Foden is a top five player in the Premier League right now. So, if not top three, like Foden has has, I mean, in the in the last three weeks, been the hottest player in the league outside of Mo Salah. Yeah, I think I think Foden and Salah are like the two players to talk about, but like other guys are good. Like yes, Bruno Bruno Fernandez also is having a fucking incredible, still an incredible year. Like. We haven't spoken about him, but he's really fucking good. Like, really, really fucking good. It's easy to overlook a positive performance on a team like United right now. Yeah, it's true. What are your thoughts on Ronaldo, Cam? Do you think that he, you know, obviously he helps out in a game like this, but do you you think he'll play a big part? So... I'm going to refer to Ole's comment or all his comments that he made uh, midweek. Any team in the basketball world would have taken Michael Jordan in his prime. And that's kind of what I feel about Ronaldo. If he's there, you got to take him, right? Like he's that good. Um, but he changes the way we play because he doesn't press. He doesn't track back. Uh, so will he play? I think that's actually an area that Pep will exploit is that, you're not going to have that pressure from someone that, like, look, I love Jesse to death. Jesse presses like crazy. If you play Jesse up front, I don't want Jesse as a striker, but if you false nine Jesse, he's going to press like mad and put pressure on the center backs. Ronaldo's not going to do that. Edison Cavani will do it. So I think at this point, I would almost not start Ronaldo in this game. I would take him off the bench in the 70th minute because the dude has a knack for scoring late game goals. But I, I really like this is a game where you need to pressure city center backs. And if we don't, I think we lose. I don't totally disagree with him there. Um, also, thinking about Jesse Lingard as a false nine is making me laugh a little bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I rate Jesse. I, said that. I rate Jesse. I think he's a yeah. very solid player. And I like him a lot coming off the left. And I think he did a lot of really good things at West Ham last year. But him as a false nine for what is supposed to be a top four club is very funny to me. What do yeah, you think man. about Donnie coming off the bench the other night? Um, I thought Donnie actually almost won us the game. I, I really say he did pretty well. Yeah, he had a shot that almost snuck in, which was kind of crazy because it came from Jaden too, and I would have loved to have seen that. 
Um, I think, I don't know, man, here's the thing. Donnie's another one of these wayward midfielders that doesn't really have a role. And I think that could almost be down to United as a team. We don't know how to build a proper midfield. We have Bruno who plays up front and then it's whoever else behind him. Like, that's the thing is we have no coherent ideology of what our midfield should be. So then you just have people who are lost in the space of like, what am I supposed to be doing? And I think that's where I ding all as a coach is like, you need to have a defined philosophy for all three phases of the game. And you clearly have an attacking philosophy, kind of have a defensive philosophy. You don't have a midfield philosophy. And I think the midfield is the most critical of all philosophy. Yeah, it is. It's it's going to be an interesting game for sure. Uh, I'm excited. You said it perfectly. It's one of those games that it literally could go from one extreme to the other. Uh, which Tell me this isn't a fun. trap game if you've ever seen one. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I feel like the last like three or four Manchester derbies have been trap games where it's like, obviously, like Man City's going to win. It just like doesn't happen. There's the one... I want to say it was two years ago at this point. They were up 2 nothing at halftime, and then Pogba does what Pogba was supposed to do for us and scores two, and we win in, like, the 90th minute. I'm like, well, well shit, man. Like, I don't know what the hell just happened. I know. It's why Manchester United are just so fascinating right now because they're in such a precarious situation, especially with Conte at Tottenham now, where it's like you can't move too quickly. Look, I, I think I said it in our, our group chat here. Temporary solutions really only seem to work at Chelsea, and Conte is a temporary solution if I've ever seen one. Um, I said some candid language to Mitchell about my thoughts on Antonio Conte as Man United's head coach. Um, I did not want that. There's two names that I would hear for United's head coach um, that I would be happy with. Outside of that, I, I think we sit pat until the summer, and then we reevaluate. You're, we're not changing our fortunes in the middle of the season. We're, mm. Like you think we're going to go on and win the league? No. Get through, get Champions League, see what we can do, in, or go through, get top four, four Champions League, see what you do in the Champions League, reevaluate in the summer. Telling me Ten Hag comes available? Bet, run it. Like Ten Hag's incredible. Julian Nagelsmann comes good? Bet, run it. But those are the only two. No Zidane for you either. Zidane is an enigma to me. Because he had the best team in the world at the time, like bar none, and won incredible amounts of trophies with it. But was it Zidane or was it the team? I totally I... agree with you, and that, but it's a name that's been thrown around lately. But I'm sure. on your team with that one. I, I think Zidane was a product of his team's success and not necessarily <sighs> his tactics. That might be one of the best teams you've ever seen play the game together. And I think he was the right manager for it because he can manage big personalities. But United need tactics now. And that's why I say Ten Hag, because Ten Hag can build a team like no other human being. And that's yeah, and it's, he had one of those teams where it's like you almost they're better when you just set it and go and let them make the decisions and play with that freedom on their own, where mm-hmm. United needs structure right now. We are not Mancini, no tactics, just vibes football. We yeah. we need tactics desperately. Hey, that won a title. <laughs> That won a title, all right? And I mean, Zidane won, like, what, four Champions Leagues doing that? Like, it works at certain places, but it definitely will not at United. I agree with that. It's also, I I think you have, yeah, you have bigger problems, too, you know, getting Woodward finally out of there and getting a sporting director that can make some fucking knowledgeable transfers would help, too. I think I would actually have been fine with Woodward staying. Really? If we brought it. If we had brought in a sporting director and removed him from transfers, he financially has the club in a fairly good position. Obviously, the Glazers have taken on debt with the club and debt finance the club, which I don't love. But in terms of sales and club net worth, um, Woodward's an immense for our club. Uh, but his sporting decisions have been atrocious. So I think, dude, you know who I would love? I would love for Uncle Pat, Patrice Evra, to come be our sporting director. That dude just oozes class and energy, and I think he would be really fun back at the club. So I would have Yo, is he gonna, seen him. Is he going to lick some raw chicken in the boardroom? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Uncle Pat's a weird guy, but I love Patrice Evers so much. I'm going to well, get weird with it every board meeting. He's a funny guy. Uh, we can keep Cam right on until the end of the episode here. I-, I have three more games to run through, and we don't have to go into much detail. And then I have a question for all of us, and we can go around and kind of give our answers too. For cool, absolutely, with that. hell yeah, I'm super cool with it. Perfect. I'm so, I'm excited. My boys in purple are gonna get talked about. Oh, fuck. 
God damn it. Ne- next one, we have Leipzig Dortmund, which is an interesting one because obviously Dortmunders in shambles. Uh, Leipzig put in a pretty good performance against PSG. Like we, we talked about Nkunku already, just playing out of his mind. I have Leipzig plus 105. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and then, like Mitch said, we're going to go over to Italy, talk about the boys in purple, Juve, Fiorentina. What is the yeah, what is the position it. right now? I'm going to pull up the Serie A table. Seventh. They're in seventh. Ooh, and a win and maybe some other oh, losses. Six. They could 3 0 win four. over the weekend. They're not it's, out of uh, out of reach in the top four in Serie A. The Pat's boys are for buzzing. They get into the top five. I am going to. Mitchell, all right. I'm going to go on wax right now. If Fiorentina make the top five of this top, what'd you say at the start? What'd you say in the first episode? What, top what was six. your top six? Fuck. Um, you know what? I'm doubling down. If Fiorentina making it into the top six of the Serie A this year for all the shit that I've been talking, I will find you and buy you the Nintendo Fiorentina kit in your size if they make the top six at the end of the season. That's what I like to hear. You know, uh, I think rate, on record, Lazio and Sari just like running themselves into the ground. It's not unrealistic. It, it's gonna happen, and I can't wait to get a new kit. Um, the only thing that I'm, I see is a downfall here is Vlavic saying, "Yeah, no, I'll, I'll pass. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be moving, moving along." Um, unbelievable talent, and honestly, it. Uh, it shakes my confidence a little bit if he if he ends up leaving in the winter window. I'll be honest. No, at Man yes. City though. At Man City, we love to cross the ball to a bunch of dudes that are five foot seven. What if we put a fucking six foot tall freak in there instead? You just need to re-sign that in Jacko. <laughs> Dude, you act like I wouldn't love that. Oh, no, no, you Nobody's would. saying that. <laughs> Nobody's saying that. The best day of my life if Ed and Dzeko re-signed for City. Are you fucking kidding me? I like that more than signing a striker. That'd be sick. <laughs> Regardless, I have this game at under two and a half goals, plus 110 odds. I think it'll be a fairly low scoring. Juve's defense has held up really well this year. Yes. Yes, um, I agree with that yeah, pick. Right, but yeah. And then the Milan Derby is the last one you know, we're going to talk about. Kind of a, a big match in Italy. The uh, AC Milan's two, Inter is three. AC Milan have been all over the place in Europe. They, they haven't played bad, though, in, in uh, Italy this year. Um, I still take the Inter money line, though. I think this is one they could... I think Inter are starting to pick up steam again uh, and starting to find their footing. Uh, it took them a few weeks. Uh, and I think a lot of that was a product of how late their players played in the summer. You have a lot of players yep. that went the whole distance in the Euros probably needed a little bit of rest to kind of get back in, you know. They were they were good midweek too. I mean, yep. granted they played our our favorite dark horse in the podcast and sheriff, but they played well. Yeah, so I have the inter money line here. AC Milan are just too inconsistent for me, man. I I don't know. I haven't saw enough out of them. They have the players, you know, Kessi, Tanali. They have players I do like. Uh I think just it was good for them. Good. They just yeah. I don't know. Haven't got the best out of them. Um That's that. Yeah, and then to wrap up the show here, I have a question from a listener, and we'll get Cam's in on this too. I have one thing first that I would like to say, given how poor we have been uh, from last week. uh, Mitchell saying we were getting another 5-0. It was a 2-2 draw. Yeah, that was a big win. Me saying... I can't see City conceding and then one of our center backs getting sent off and we lose 2-0. You going 3 for 11 on bets. Um, I would like to give the main stand the hair dryer treatment for the week. <laughs> Fucking, we need it. <laughs> we that's are funny. the hair dryer this week. Yeah, that's the beauty of it, though. I mean, we're so just throw paint on the wall. I mean, what are you going to do? It's I, I, it might stick, it might not. Who knows, man? There are anyway. was a non-sticky day. No, that was a bad color. <laughs> We're gonna paint over it. Anywho, Josh, someone that 
for some reason, people watch this podcast and they have a question for us. Yes. So our buddy Will Highland in Maine um, just bought his first Tottenham jersey. We got to give him a shout out for that. Uh, but his go. question is: This is kind of like a you probably get bantered for this in England talking about this. But if you didn't support your current club, who would you support in the Premier League? Ooh, it has to be Premier League. If you yeah, didn't so support your current club. You can give your uh, European team too, but if you had to choose an English team, who would it be? Well, my second is not in the Prem anymore, but used to be. I love Queen's Park Rangers, and it was mostly for Joey Barton. That's a good one. Huh? I, I would be a Fulham fan if I wasn't a City fan. Oh, Fulham and the American Connection. I love that. I, I mean, whatever... Whatever you want to say, say it. But I would kiss Clint Dempsey right on his fucking bald head. So I would be a Fulham fan. Even with that rap career? I don't fucking care, dude. Look what he did for the national team. I've never <laughs> seen fair. anybody do a fucking Cryf turn like that and score for the national team except for him. And if you if you know, you know the goal mm. I'm talking about. I love Clint Dempsey. I would be a Fulham fan. Dude, they have to do an AEW pay-per-view at Craven Cottage. Fuck yes. The guy owns Fuck yes. That would be electric. Uh, for for me, it would be Villa. It that's a good one. It would be Villa. Um, just, and that's just based on when I started following soccer. It was just one of those teams that it was fun to watch. And, you know, I think – it's an easy, it's an easy team to look at and be like, they have a very loyal fan base. It's small, but mighty. And I, I like that. I like the underdog. I like it. Uh, mine, behind that. mine, despite the heartbreak they caused us, uh, probably be palace. I think palace just have a great, great fan base and the great club culture. And also just the, uh, having the chance to go to Selhurst Park every week would be incredible. I obviously went when they played Leicester, I I think when I went and it was just a fucking electric ground, great experience. And I I think Palace is just a great team. That's like always just barely in the premier league. And they always look like they might challenge one year, like for like the top half, but never do. They're just kind of a fun team to support. They always have, a, you know, that exciting player that likes to dribble on the wing. You know, Zaha, and now we're seeing it with Eze and uh, Connor Gallagher. They're a little exciting. Uh, that'd be my team in the prime. Hey, Josh? They're fun. Yeah. Can you just admit that you'd only like Crystal Palace because they have cheerleaders? I didn't know that. And, a, and an eagle. <laughs> yeah, the, only an eagle de- the, the eagle is dead. The e- did, wow. Okay. It died right. Like Dark. All right, be hey, my dog. Yeah, no, taking a turn for the worst. Crystal Palace, the only team in the Prem that has cheerleaders. Wild! I didn't even know that. <laughs> America. Who would you guys Definitely. choose, international or European? Ooh. Yo, it's really depressing to think about this right now, but with my affinity for Lionel Messi, I would be a Barca fan if I wasn't if I was going international. So, Josh, you and I would have even more beef than we might already have. I'd Internet. probably go Dortmund. Uh, that was um, exactly yep. my answer. Oh, my God. Wall, man. I would be in the minority again. I, I just think Dortmund's atmosphere, the yellow wall, is just such an intimidating thing. It's, a, it's an intimidating ground. They, they always have talent. They've always had talent. And they're a good side to watch. It's hard to see them struggling right now. But... I feel like yeah. we have this like friendly connection with Dortmund now too because of Jurgen Klopp. Like we have a soft spot for him a little bit. I feel like that a lot of Liverpool fans are like that. My, I mean, mine wasn't even what didn't have anything to do with Klopp. It was more to do with like Royce, yeah, Hummels. Like just seeing them fucking play and the, the just the impact they had on the on the game in Germany was huge. I also loved, like, when they played Liverpool in that knockout tie in the Europa League. That was one of the first, like, you know, knockout ties. I know it wasn't that long ago, but it was, like, just, like, scintillating football. And it's like, wow, this team is so much like Liverpool. Like, it's hard not to be, like, rooting for them a little bit. They're just incredible. Generally good, but most of the time kind of come up short. Yeah, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. They're the little guys in Germany, too, though. Easy. Thanks, Pat. 
I'm going to give a quick shout out to my team because I've been there and I supported them for a long time and I still do kind of, sort of, just a little tough right now, Sevilla. I love Sevilla. I was there for a Europa League win. They just have the Europa League on lock. Their stadium is incredible. Uh, dudes are just sitting out smoking cigarettes outside like everyone's Mauricio Sarri. So it's just a brilliant, brilliant <laughs> place in the world. So that uh, would be a nice, just, place, uh, nice place for an away day too, I imagine. Beautiful city, man. Wonderful. wonderful Yo, sorry, Ali, sorry, I lost that scarf in a house fire, dog. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more that you lost than that, that. That should be a concern, but that's okay. But yeah, I French lost jersey. The scarf. And the French jersey uh, you brought up. Yes. We're, we're but, doing great. Yeah, they we're fine. Everything's fine. We, uh, I don't know. That's it. I was going to try to end the episode, but if you got something else to say, I'll just I, fucking I have tuck one into more the thing to say, and it's a possible new segment I think we should do, or at least talk about. Maybe we can enter negotiations next week. But a okay. lot of USL teams, new teams are doing like some ownership thing where you have to like you buy like a membership fee and have voting rights. And I think we should become owners. Of a club? Of a USL club? We need like Dude, one I'm share. We need one so share. Game. I am so okay. We don't even need to take it to a vote. Let's fucking do it. I'm game. Sign and we can up. we can have like we can decide our vote like on the show. Like whenever there's a big Fuck vote yeah. thing, we have to talk Fuck about yeah. it on the show. Wait, the Absolutely. Team that, the team that just sprung up in Maine, what league are they? USL. USL They'll one. be a USL team, one. yeah. All right. just, just but they don't have a know. team or a roster yet, but I already love them. <laughs> Forest City, baby. Forest City, bitch. Forest, Forest City, F- bitch. F- squared. Hey, uh, bitch. it's just... Just before uh, you guys close up shop, thanks for having me on. It's always fun to talk with you guys and chat shit about soccer. And uh, anytime you guys need anything United, uh, I'm your guy. I honestly yeah, thought it would be big less up civil to today. I Bro, did too. Uh, Pat can Next back episode. me up on this. Pat can back me up on this. I might be the most like even keel and rational United fan that you'll ever come across because I understand that most of us are fucking delusional. Just don't pee. You know what? I will back him up on that. House. I just don't. You just, the one thing I refuse to accept is chat and shit on this man's name. <laughs> <laughs> Not fucking happening on the Instagram, or else you will get called out. The, uh, dude, you know what? Difference of opinion makes the world go round, and Drogba's still better. Listen, Cam, okay, we're going to close the podcast <laughs> out with this. Dude, you're just wrong. I'm sorry, man. That's like, fine. I really want it. I tried to defend the take on the pod that episode, but bro, dude, look at what Sal is doing this year. On like, form, yeah.